I'll do it again. Praise the Lord, everyone. <laughs> Let's all stand and pray if you are able to stand at this moment. I want to commend you for the tremendous uh, attention you gave last night and also for the ministering you did one to another here in the school. It's a marvelous thing to have the Holy Ghost uh, just make a divine, ostentatious entrance and confirm what he is doing and cause it to become indelibly ingrained in the tissues and fibers of your heart and soul. Let's lift our hands and just praise the Lord for a moment before we are seated and begin. Lord Jesus, tonight I thank you for the wonder-working power of Almighty God. I am grateful for the privilege and honor of standing before this outstanding group of students. Such hunger and such intensity for the things of God. I praise you for our people. I praise you for apostolic Christianity. I thank you tonight. Anoint us both to hear and to speak. I pray for the anointing of the Holy Ghost to be upon me as I teach and transmit here tonight. We give you praise, glory, and honor. Bind us together in one mind and accord and one accord. And God, help us, I pray, to have a spirit of revelation and understanding. We give you praise, glory, and honor. We ask these things in the matchless, resplendent, all-powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. <clears throat> the Lord bless you. You may be seated. If you feel like clapping and just lifting your voice of praise, one more time, do it. In the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, I hope to get all the way through the oneness of God, the mighty God in Christ, and also where are the dead, and the preliminary introduction to uh, the tabernacle plan, which I'll be teaching tomorrow night. And we'll also be working beginning with Daniel's 70th week. So far, we are good with our schedule. Tonight, I want to discuss with you the mighty God in Christ. You'll find that in the numerical category 8 and on page 123. <clears throat> the, the reason I'm able to teach you basically the same Bible college education that I received in a week's time is because all of this that you're handling, when you turn those pages, it took me three years to copy by hand but it's all been transcribed into uh, this particular syllabus and typed up. So the material has already been written. It's a matter of you listening to the lecture and maybe making your own notes as we go along. And it's a great way to learn. I am delighted to give this to you. I'm delighted to transmit it to you because if we can all get to doing exactly the same thing, we can reach our world. There's no doubt about it. If I, I can do what I can do by myself, but if I can get you to help me, we can do so much more. And I have a vote, a great vote of confidence in you and your great ability toward God. So, the mighty God in Christ, the revelation, the oneness of God is the oldest doctrine in existence. The doctrine of the one, oneness of God is the oldest doctrine in existence. The oneness of God is as old as God himself because there's always and only been one God. But with the death of the last apostles, and most of the apostles were killed by martyrdom, but with the death of the last apostle, they actually became like circuit writing uh, preachers. They carried the gospel everywhere. Paul evangelized the then known world with this gospel and all of Asia heard the gospel. But with the death of the last apostle, what happened was there was not a Bible in existence. You couldn't go to a Bible bookstore and pick up a Bible like this. Everything was written by hand. In those days, a copy of the Bible could cost you from fifteen to $20,000 because it was all written by hand. So the Word of God was not readily available to anyone in the public. 
So with the death of the apostles to keep preaching it, the truth, and with a famine in the land for the word of God, not having access to buy copies of the scriptures, and much of the New Testament was even the process of being written, you can see that there would have been a famine for the word of God. It was not available for them to read, to study, to keep together the concepts, the precepts, the truth that the apostles had preached. And so there arose a group of people called apologists, and they began to write their understandings. And without going into a lot of detail, the truth became lost, basically lost, from apostolic Christianity. Apostolic Christianity, as the apostles knew it, lasted strongly until at least 100 AD. After that, between 100 AD and 150 AD, things began to deteriorate quickly because the apologists wrote their own concepts into it. We're the only people that can go all the way back from this present hour to 33 AD because we are apostolic Christians. We preach exactly what the apostles preached in the beginning. Repentance with divine forgiveness. Baptism by immersion in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. The infilling of the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking with tongues. The revelation of the oneness of God. And these signs shall follow them that believe. They shall in my name cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They, believers, shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's what Christianity was in the beginning. In fact, in the beginning, there was only one kind of Christianity. If you were not a Christian, you could be a Jew. If you were not a Jew, you were just an out-and-out -out heathen and pagan, and there were many forms of paganism and heathenism. So in the beginning, there was Judaism, there was heathenism and paganism, and there was Christianity. And in the beginning, there was only one kind of Christianity, and it was the kind you read about in the book of Acts. Nothing else existed. But the devil, through the intellect and man, and this gospel, the spiritual things, they war against the flesh, and the flesh wars against them. So what has happened is now we have all kinds of Christianity in the world. When you walk up to someone and they say, that, they say I'm a Christian, it doesn't mean anything at all. You have to find out what kind of a Christian they are before you can even begin to negotiate them. But in the beginning, if you said you were a Christian, they knew you spoke with tongues. You believed in one God and you were baptized in Jesus' name. It's a tremendous victory for the devil to have divided and to made and created all these different kinds of Christianity. I thank God that we can relate to the Christianity that is in Acts chapter 2 and throughout the book of Acts. Everyone say, Amen. Amen. With all of this confusion then, the apostles knew who Jesus was. They knew that Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. They knew that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had manifested himself in flesh and that Jesus was that flesh. They believed in the oneness of God. God invisible in the Old Testament, visible in the New Testament, and a regenerating force in the church when the church was born. So because of this, once you get beyond 100 AD, once you get beyond 150 AD and into those 200s and 300s, they really didn't know who Jesus was. They had lost the revelation, the understanding of the mighty God in Christ. So in church history, the first four church councils dealt with one question, Christology. Who is Jesus Christ? Who was he? Was he divine? Totally. Was he partially divine? Was he human? How much human? And there were, there were all kinds of opinions as to how much divine he was, how much human he was. And you can research those things on your own. You may find it very interesting. But the, four, the, the first four church councils in church history dealt with Christology. Who is Jesus Christ? For example, in Nicaea in AD 325, 
it was discussed there. Then in the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and then again in AD 431 in Ephesus, the Council of Ephesus, they were still trying to figure out who was Jesus, how divine was he, how human was he, was he all God, was he all man, with just a touch of God in him, like a drop of water from the ocean. It went on and on. And then in AD 451, there was the Council of Chalcedon. And the councils continued through history. But the first four church councils, which are of more interest to us for our purpose here tonight, was to deal with Christology, who was Jesus Christ. So in the world today, in the so-called realm of Christianity, the world of Christianity, we know what tradition says. We know. I've studied history backwards and forwards in church history, and I'm sure that most of you have done a lot of research also. We know what tradition says, but what does the Bible say? The Bible is the final source of appeal. It is not what man thinks that counts. It's what this book says that counts, because out of this book, you will be judged at the judgment bar of God. Not some writings by the Evangelical Free Church, or the Catholic Church, or the Lutheran Church, or the Methodist Church. You will be judged out of this book, and this book alone. This is the plumb line by which we will be measured in the end result. The mainstream truth in the Bible is that there is only one God. When I say mainstream truth, I'm talking about something like this. In most countries, there is some major river that flows through the country. In the United States, there is the Mississippi River. It starts way far in the north near the Canadian border and goes all the way down and empties into the Gulf of Mexico. There is one major tributary here. But along the way, there are many smaller streams that flow into this particular Mississippi River that make it a, a just a massive flow of water here. So there is a mainstream truth, but there are other tributaries that flow into this. There are verses, unfortunately, in the Bible due to Trinitarian translators that would make it appear that there's more than one God, or more than one person in the Godhead. But they're only small tributaries, and because the mainstream truth in the Bible is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Of necessity, all of those smaller tributaries flow, must be made to flow into the mainstream truth. Hear, O Israel. Everyone say, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one God. You want to try it in Hebrew? I'll teach you. I'll do it from the top down. Shema Israel Adonai Elohinu Adonai Echad. And on the last word, Echad, you have to scrape your throat. Okay? So it goes like this Shema Israel Adonai Elohinu Adonai Echad. 